Welcome everyone. Um, we're gonna take just a few minutes before we get started to make sure people are able to log on um, and that everybody is able to hear us and things are set up well. So I'm giving people a few minutes to get logged in to the webinar. Uh, if you have any immediate needs or questions, you can type them into the chat if you need to. We're also live on Facebook. Um, so facebook.com slash HSUNASP. That's the HSU Native American Studies Program Facebook. Uh, if people did not get the um, webinar link, you can watch us via Facebook Live. And we will also be posting the recording of this webinar on our Native American Studies YouTube page. Um, if you Google Native American Studies Humboldt State, it should come up uh, and it should be up early next week. So <clears throat> if you're watching the webinar today and you think, oh, I wanna review that again, it should be up early next week on our YouTube page. Um, in addition, we have a couple of quick announcements. So the program that we are being, that we are fortunate to be a part of today, uh, the Advocacy and Water Protection in Native California series um, is co-sponsored by the HSU Native American Studies Department and Save California Salmon. And if you have not visited the Save California Salmon website, I would highly recommend doing it. We are posting the um, materials from each of the presentations on the Save California Salmon website. And so if you are interested in the slides today and you have questions about them, they will be posted on the Save California Salmon website and you can get access to them there. That's information for you in case one of the questions you might have is, um, uh, where can I find this information? If you, I can, I'm gonna put a link to it into the chat so you can have it, but it's, uh, it's californiasalmon.org and there is a tab that is the Advocacy and Water Protection in Native California series. Um, if you have registered as part of the uh, certificate program that we're offering this summer, um, I want to remind everyone that we will send you and have sent you links to the evaluation forms. That's how we are making sure that people have attended the events. And it also gives us a lot of information and feedback that we need. So please uh, make sure to fill out your evaluation form after this is over so we can make sure that it counts towards your certificate series. If you have not registered for the certificate series, but you're interested in it, uh, you can still register for the series. And we have given everyone uh, until August 1st to complete the requirements. And all of the um, webinar links are, uh, are at the YouTube page. And that is how you can catch up on the requirements if you miss them. So there's still a way that you can complete the certificate series if you would like and you have not registered yet. Um, so there's a lot of places to get good information about the series and I wanted to make sure that people knew that before we got started in case those are some of the questions that might come up today as you uh, are able to hear from our amazing speakers. Um, so I'm gonna get started with our introductions and discussions today. I wanna welcome everyone to um, our webinar presentation on uh, salmon and acorns feed our people if you have not had an opportunity to pick up the book, um, I would highly recommend that you do that. It is an amazing text. And what I really appreciate about it is that it is divided up so that you can um, use each of the chapters on their own if you need to. And that, you know, there it's really easily teachable to people, which I think is important. And I have used several of the chapters in my own um, teaching and I will say that you know people respond very well to them they're they're very well laid out and what is really what we really appreciate the most about this work is that Kari made a really important effort to make this a community-based endeavor something that um, I think community people could feel very proud of and really talking about the importance of their knowledge and the ways in which they understand connections between environmental justice, environmental racism, uh, and what's happening in our regions. So I, there's a couple of things that we need to do before we start. The first is I'm going to begin with um, an acknowledgement of the lands that we're on. 
So I am Dr. Kutcher Risling Baldy. If you don't know me, I am the Native American Studies Department Chair. I'm also Hupa, Yurik, and Karuk. Um, we are the three like big tribes here in Northern California. Uh, I'm enrolled in the Hoopa Valley Tribe. Um, and I grew up in this region and am very proud of the work that I've been able to do as a result of my, um, my ties to this land and this place and growing up being able to go gathering with my family members, um, go swimming with people in the rivers, uh, go fishing and to eat, you know, salmon and acorns my whole life. And I know that that's not a privilege that a lot of people have still to this day. And and I also know that there are so many of us and so many of the younger generation too that are really working to reconnect to our foods and to our life ways. And so what I see in our future is a lot of opportunity uh, and a lot of like visioning that is gonna make a, a radical future that everybody can be excited about. And so I'm really excited about what we're gonna get to talk about today. And I will say that, um, you know, acorns are really important to us and uh, we are acorn peoples and we're salmon peoples. Um, and I think it's really important for us to remember that and to really think about like uh, the way we are nourished by our ancestral foods so that we can have good conversations and that we can feel good about ourselves um, and we can wake ourselves up. My uh, grandma used to tell me like, if you wanna really know how to wake yourself up, like you eat acorns and you go for a run and then you jump in the river. And mm -hmm. those are like the things that connect you to your place, but they also wake your brain up so that you can think better and you can like have ideas that are gonna change the world. So I wanted to start today with the land acknowledgement and I will tell people like uh, my land acknowledgements are a little different and I hope they catch on. Uh, when I do land acknowledgements, I think it is very important to acknowledge the land of the peoples uh, in the place in which you are, because those peoples are still there. They are still important to that region. But I also make sure that with any land acknowledgement I give, that there is a course of action that I am asking people to do because they are on that land. I think that land acknowledgements need to be action oriented. They aren't meaningful if they're just there to say indigenous peoples exist. Uh, we know we exist. We're very happy to be here, um, but we need people to step up and say, well, what does that make me responsible to? And what does that inspire me to do now that I know that? So um, today I want to acknowledge that I'm coming from, I'm coming to you from McKinleyville, California, uh, along like Baduat, which the Wiat call Baduat in Wiat territory. Um, and it is the home of the Wiat peoples. They are still uh, in, like stewardship and relationship with this place. They are incredibly um, powerful peoples to know. They are a community of people, I think, who are very welcoming and open and who also really support people in this region to think about this region as we at land. Um, I'm also fortunate that today we are going to be talking primarily about Karuk lands and I am Karuk and I have been to those areas and done ceremonies in those areas. And I think that I, want people to know about the Karuk that they are a very resilient people. And if you don't know a lot about the Karuk, you should realize that of the tribes in this region, they had some of the worst things perpetuated against them during the gold rush. And they are one of the tribes with uh, the smallest like land holdings and land areas, even though they're very near many like national parks and state parks. And that to me is um, a problem. We need to think about how the Karuks are not given access, but also don't have really large land holdings and why that happened. So for your course of action today, since we are going to talk about the Karuks, and um, Ryan is actually joining us from Karuk land, uh, I, we are going to ask that you do two things. The first is I am going to give you the site. Uh, it's a Facebook site for the Endowment for Ecocultural Revitalization. Um, they are an organization that has been established to protect fish, assist wildlife, educate youth, and return fire to people. And they focus a lot in the Karuk area. And I would like you to go to Facebook and look them up, the Endowment for Ecocultural Revitalization, and like their Facebook page, if you have not before, to make sure that you can get information about the work that they're doing with Native youth. I am also going to give you a link to the Humboldt Area Foundation website. 
this is uh, if you go. Oops, that's the wrong one. I guess. Let me see. HAF. Um, let's see. Oh no, it just doesn't have a space in it. Um, hopefully, you can see that. If you go to this website from the Humble Area Foundation, or you Google the Endowment for Ecocultural Revitalization, it actually is the first website that should come up for the Humble Area Foundation. This is where you can donate to the Ecocultural Revitalization Fund. It's an opportunity to put money toward the work that the um, Karuk people are doing and the youth are doing. And so I wanna read you what they say about this fund. Uh, this fund is dedicated to program support for tribal partnerships focusing on ecocultural revitalization activities. Its focus is to reconnect the hearts, hands, and minds of people to the natural environment. The cultural relationships of indigenous peoples with their ancestral homeland environments are being more imperiled with each generation. Indigenous knowledge is founded in practice and belief. Without being a component of ecosystem process, the functional role of humans is removed from our landscapes. Traditional ecological knowledge, practice, and belief systems can be revitalized, and it may be our best chance to learning to live with fire in our rural communities once again. It is with great hope this fund will grow to support our work in the Western Klamath Mountains and beyond. When you think of water, fish, wildlife, plants, and people in partnership with ecosystem processes and functions, please support this endowment fund. And I would like to say to people that if you feel like, well, I can't give very much money. Um, I'm somebody who does a lot of fundraising and I can tell you that as a person who is constantly like working to do the work that we do in our communities, even a $5 donation uh, helps and tells us that people care about the work that we're doing. And so today I'm asking people to do what they can to support this organization, uh, uplift them on Facebook, share their stories and voices, ask other people to donate or donate yourself I also tell people, if you donate to the Ecocultural Revitalization Fund today, I am at Kutcha Baldi on Twitter. You can tag me in a tweet and I will share that you have donated and the reason why and tell people that you participated in this process and you were willing to give of the things that you were doing here to help support the people that are doing this work. So tag me, you can tag me on Instagram and I will share it there too. Um, so that's your courses of action for today. And if you follow through, please let me know. And I would love to share with people that you were able to do that. Uh, I'm gonna do a quick introduction of our speakers for today um, and then let them take it away. So uh, today we have two uh, esteemed speakers that I'm very excited about, Kari Norgard and Ryan Reed. Um, I would like to begin by uh, reading the bios that we have for them that they submitted. I'm just gonna pull them up really quick, give me one second. Um, hold on, I've got too many things open. Looks like you have two different screens too, I'm jealous. Is. <laughs> can you see, like in, I probably you can see, right? Um, I just keep bouncing back and forth. Yeah, there's like a million screens up right now. Uh, <laughs> Where did they go? I clicked on them. Oh, okay, here we go. So I'll start with Ryan Reed's bio. Um, so Ryan Reed was born and raised at the center of the world of Aboriginal Karuk territory. And during his junior year at the University of Oregon, he is majoring in environmental studies and minoring in Native American studies. Uh, he, hold on, it disappeared. Um, while attending U of O, he has had many monumental experiences working alongside Dr. Kari Norgard. These opportunities included numerous panel discussions and guest speaker series. Most recently, uh, he was in, in Aotearoa or New Zealand, a panel discussion on indigenous fire practice and as he represented a Karuk fire enthusiast and spring salmon ceremonial priest. So that is Ryan Reed that's here with us today. Um, and then we have Kari Norgard who's also joining us. Uh, and Kari Norgard is a professor Sorry, she's a professor, Kari Norgard, at the University of Oregon, um, an associate professor of sociology and environmental studies. She's trained as a postdoctoral fellow in the interdisciplinary IGRT program on the invasive species at University of California, Davis. 
She joined the University of Oregon faculty in 2011, and over the past 10 years has worked and published and taught in the areas of environmental sociology, gender and environment, race and environment, climate change, sociology of culture, and social movements. Um, and she has done so much work in the Kudu community. Again, if you have interest in what she's doing, I would highly recommend that you pick up her book, Salmon and Acorns, Feed Our People. Uh, so I'm gonna have you all take it away. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. Let's see, we'll get the screen shared. Thank you so much. Um, let's see. Uh, oh no, I can't share my computer audio without logging in some fancy way. Um, not good. Apologize for this. Let's see, how do I get back to just Are you all seeing, are you all seeing that now? It's kind of like um, zoomed in now. Yeah, that's a little strange. Um, because are you seeing, do you see my boxes on the side with my? Yeah, I oh. see like the faces on the right. Your Let, me try again. Let me try again. Oh, I, I think that when we do the video, it's not gonna work to do, um, I, I may or I will see if I'm able to do the, um, oh, it says just portion of screen, uh, excuse me. I think for the video, if you're on a different browser, you'll have to, um, oh, that's good right there. Yeah, um, okay, sorry for the little uh, technical, uh, we're learning these things sometimes. <laughs> um, thank you so much for, um, uh, I think uh, Ryan and I'll just say a few words and then we'll see if we can get started with the video. But um, I know that um, it is such an incredible honor to be doing this today and connected. And um, thank you for you know, the kind words about the book. There's so many things um, that could be said and, and, and so forth. And one of the things is Kacha, every time I've had any interaction with you and there haven't been so many yet, I learned so much and I just really appreciate uh, all the organizing that you demonstrated there. Uh, not to mention I'm not savvy enough to be on Twitter. Um, but I first met you through your work on the Why We Gather article and um, have just learned so much. And for those who haven't read Dr. Riesling Baldi's um, uh, book, We Are Dancing For You, I can say that it is absolutely incredible. And we, um, I read the first few lines of it, put my head down on my desk and cried and assigned it to my graduate seminar without reading any more. Um, and it was the, a complete success. Um, so it's really an honor to be able to, um, to be here and to talk about the book, talk about work that uh, we've been doing for a long time that I've had the privilege to be a part of for a long time through uh, Ryan's father, who you'll see some slides of. And um, um, it's been wonderful and amazing having Ryan um, at University of Oregon. We've done a few talks together, but this will be, as you can see already, a little bit, um, the technology is not quite the same as being together in person. Um, and I also want to say I'm doing this today from Eastern Washington, from Walla Walla territory, not too far from uh, Treaty Rock, where the Treaty uh, Council was signed with uh, Walla Walla, um, Cayuse, and I'm not sure all, everyone who was there. And the, um, that the work that we've done on the Klamath, we've had good relationships with folks in Confederated Tribes of Umatilla and learned a lot from them around a lot of their food, um, uh, food work, especially we did a two a collaborative work on freshwater mussels for about two years. So um, that's just a little bit to get us started. Thank you for having me. Thank you, Kari. Ayuki Uke, Chenneth Wayamanam, Juan Kumon, Ryan Reed. Uh, hello, uh, Ryan Reed, and thank you, Kacha, and uh, thank you, Carrie, for having me and Kari on, you know, uh, on this webinar and this series. It's wonderful. Um, uh, I've kind of came into contact with Kutch, I am more on a personal and academic at the same time, as, you know, as, as um, confusing as that is, but um, connections throughout my other siblings, and uh, we actually met up in New Zealand too, and I think that was the first time I've actually interacted with Kutch, and again, you know, she's a phenomenal uh, Native woman who has a lot of knowledge and is really um, uh, exemplifying of, of what the next generations uh, can aspire to, and uh, you know, I appreciate being on here today and, uh, you know, really just talking about my life is kind of what I'm here today. And, um, and 
And I thank you, Kari, for kind of being that mentor and um, being that person to put me, you know, let my voice be heard. And I don't think I would have the opportunity with not only today, but, you know, previous um, opportunities in the past that I would not be able to do what I'm doing today and where I'm at today. And so thank you for that. And um, yeah, so I'm Kadu Koop on Yurok. I'm actually Hoopa Valley tribal member too. And so um, I grew up on Kadu Gansa Sestory, uh, right above Kadu Mean, center of the world for Kadu people. Um, youngest sibling of, of many. Um, and, you know, grew up in a community uh, that really, communities, I guess, plural. And I want to acknowledge that I'm a part of and learned a lot from different communities within the climate basin and outside too. And so um, I want to give credit where it's due and the things that I know and who I am today is, um, is because of the communities that helped me through and uh, whether it's just giving me opportunities or giving me some more support. And so, you know, I want to thank uh, the people who, who have given me um, the knowledge and the courage to step up to certain opportunities that come to me. And so, um, yeah. And, um, Again, I'm, I'm excited. This is like the first time we've, first of all, done like an online talk together. And, and this feels like it's kind of the first time it's being home with, you know, other peers that I've grown up with. And I don't think a lot of people have seen me in this academic type of mindset. So it's exciting and a little bit of nervous <clears throat> tension with it, but, you know, it's going to be awesome. So. All right. Thank you. So let's see. I'm going to try to pull stop sharing for a second there start a new share that is advanced and we'll see if we can get the audio and then it may not uh it wants me to because it wants me to sign in but it's, it seems like you all could see let's see um can you see that does it look like it's working yeah Okay. okay, so we'll, um, we we'll wanted to just start really quickly, you know, there's so many ways, there's so many things to be said and so many um, uh, ways to tell the story and certainly, um, you know, Ryan and I first met some 15, 18 years ago and um, his dad and I, uh, Ron Reed and the whole Reed family have just changed um, my whole three generations of my family's life. And uh, so just uh, maybe by way of starting a, a little bit bigger picture for those who may not know as much about the Klamath Basin, um, starting with this film clip, it's just two minutes long, um, uh, entitled Cut of Creation Story, that um, begins actually with showing images of Ron um, dip net fishing at Ishipishi Falls and is narrated um, by Ryan's grandmother. And uh, Ryan, I don't know if you want to say anything more about this. Yeah, yeah um, I mean, this. This is kind of, it's funny because it's on YouTube, but you know, it hits, um, hits all aspects of who we are, you know, on the spiritual level and um, it, it connects on all levels. Like Kari said, some people might know a little bit about Kudu culture or Kudu people, um, but uh, this video is a good introduction for people who have no idea about who we are. And so, um, and it's, and it's another thing at home that, you know, I just watch randomly, you know, when I'm kind of in a slump, you know, back in Eugene and, um, it, it really encompasses of where I come from because my dad's in it, you know, my uncles, cousins, um, and my grandma Vera who passed away on years ago. And so it's kind of like, it's running down memory lane and, um, also like it's, uh, inspiration for the future as well. So this, this is an awesome video. We dedicate this to the spirit people who walk before us to the people who will walk after us. The first spirit people from the center of the world netted the salmon. Akadamin was a spirit man. He made the salmon. He put them in a pool. They got bigger. He put them in the river to go downriver to the ocean. 
When they returned, they were caught by a diplomat. They taught us how to fish. That's why we do it this way. The first spirit people gave us the river and the salmon to survive. That's why we, Karuk, are called the river people. That's what we live for right here. We like to give our fish to the elders. It shows a great amount of respect that our elders are very important, our babies are very important. And what we do this this generation, our generation, is what's gonna carry us on. So I think um, I think that that came through a little um, odd on the. Excuse me, I just got to get out of that. Um, the video too, so it's. I think it has a lot. Didn't, didn't come through quite right. I don't think. Um, but yeah, I guess I'll speak on that before you know we start our slides and. Um, and really, what we're gonna speak on today and. Um, what really what Kudu culture is about is you know a lot of it's exemplified in that video and um, it, it's about spread transfer of knowledge from generation to generation you see younger those are actually my older siblings in that video and so you can kind of see of how long ago that was made but it's still relevant today and you know transfer of knowledge from the older generations to the younger you know that's a, a huge aspect of cultural longevity that um, you know, that we're striving for day to day, you know, as cutting people and, um, and also just what it means to be a cutting person, you know, we're salmon, we're salmon people, uh, we're acorn people, just like what uh, Dr. Kutchbaldi recently said. So, um, you know, and that's what it's about. You know, if you, if you look at those people in those, in that video that you see, you see a sense of usefulness, you know, that, that mental aspect becomes uh, relevant and, very apparent when you're practicing culture and that's what that is. And so um, I don't want to go strictly on the, on that video alone because it's going to keep uh, coming up throughout the talk today. And so I'll just say that I'll, I'll keep that up that for now. Thank you. So oops, let's see, how do I now? Okay. Um, so Ryan and I'll just you know, kind of tag team back and forth, but um, we put together slides and talked a little bit about kind of how we'll do this. And, um, you know, because we each have very different entry points, I would say to the story and to this book or to, you know, these lives. I'm an academic, obviously, I'm, I'm not native. My ancestry is uh, Norwegian. Uh, my first book was about, uh, set in Norway and about uh, some of the uh, issues that people face in terms of environmental privilege. And um, so, you know, my, my lens through this is, um, you know, much more my involvement through the scientific process and really kind of at the juncture of indigenous and Western science in some very interesting ways. So um, we'll kind of tag team back and forth and, and each sort of share things that, that seem relevant for you. And again, thinking about putting this together for this, uh, thinking about water protection and native California, it's really an honor to be a part of this. And we'll try to frame our comments in a way that are useful for this group of you. So my life changed quite dramatically in about 04, I guess late 03, when I met uh, Ryan's father, Ron Reed. And um, we ended up uh, working together, which we've still been, we've been working together ever since on a variety of projects. And um, that research, our first research project actually made it on the front cover of the Washington Post because the ideas um, that were that research came, um, no tribe had claimed that a dam was giving them artificially high rates of diabetes before in a federal process. And um, that was the area that we came, uh, came together on. So this is a little bit of that first report and um, the Washington Post story. And um, the, essentially, uh, Ron had been working with um, the FERC process and uh, traveling and um, giving a lot of testimony about the social, cultural, and health impacts 
of, of what was happening on the river, of the fact that the salmon can't get, those dams don't have fish passage, and so salmon couldn't get up above them. And um, when Pacific Corps filed their final license application, it, um, it was, here's a picture of it, you can see with the late Ronnie Pierce, who was a kind of tribes um, advocate and one of um, Ron's mentors, uh, was this tall, but did not reflect um, the issues that he had been facing. And Ryan, I can see you if you want to just signal, if you wave your hand, or whatever you want me to go or not. Yeah, this yeah, is this, a, this is an 04, so you can kind of see. This is a, I was born in 2000, so you can see that you probably have a lot more intel on that than I do. So that's all good. When I first when I first met this young man, he wouldn't talk to me. He was like, I, he gave me a look. He's like, I don't know you. <laughs> anyway, so um, thinking about advocacy and river advocacy. Um, the, you know, the part of the story has been the relationship between the scientific uh, process, the scientific, you know, report that we did uh, that I'll say a little bit more about as well, um, which describes many of the issues that Ryan and his family and community um, live intimately. Um, and then it's also been about advocacy in the streets. And so uh, very early on, my partner, my husband and I joined um, a tribal delegation to Scotland that was um, putting pressure on Pacific Corps around the dams. So you can see the resemblance of the sign that um, Ron Reed there and Merv George Jr. are holding um, uh, to the book title. And I also just, there's, I should get more people on these pictures. Um, there's many, many, many people that I have learned from, that I continue to learn from. Um, some of them are pictured here. And, um, you know, it's really the work that I've been doing Again, it's been sort of at this, there's a lot of racism and colonialism in the fact that I'm even in the picture here because Ron had been um, you know, traveling to meetings, talking about his experiences, talking about the ways that health, his community's health impacted, uh, were impacted by those dams, impacted by the loss of salmon and all these things. And it didn't get traction until he and I started working together and I with a PhD um, was, you know, began, um, you know, looking at some of the scientific data, these kinds of things, and, and that's when it became very powerful. So we can look at this as a positive story of the ways that the blending of indigenous science and, and Western science can be very powerful in advocacy, um, but I do want to acknowledge that there's also uh, something wrong with um, his voice not having been taken seriously uh, prior to that. And um, so, um, I've had the privilege to do a variety of other policy work, including um, Ryan and I, Ryan work gave some input as well on the most recent of that, which is a Cutter Tribes Climate Adaptation Plan. Um, but they've been, the Cutter have been doing a lot of really important work um, and really innovative work in a variety of ways around fire, um, around knowledge sovereignty, um, as you can see here. Um, yeah, I'll speak on a little bit of that. Just um, again, you know, uh, Kari's phenomenal uh, PhD, who has done, you know, tremendous amount of work um, from an academic standpoint. And so, you know, like she mentioned before, you know, we come in at different, um, come into the story at different times and in different pathways. And so, um, you know, the one of the few things is just the incoming junior uh, in academia is that a lot of what I know and what I, I talk about is, you know, from life experience and um, and kind of learning, you know, that's having that credibility of growing up in this landscape. Um, you know, that's where I come from and growing up and with my dad being a part of this work and, um, having that, uh, those partnerships with Kari and, uh, people from Berkeley or people from Stanford. And, you know, I grew up with that atmosphere and, um, going to, you know, I was like a kid traveling down Sacramento, going to protests, you know, and fighting for our salmon. Um, and those are my early childhood memories side by coinciding by going fishing at the Ishikishi Falls, you know, and those are the earliest memories I'd ever had. And so, and so I was kind of born into this, um, cultural and traditional lifestyle, um, partnered with, uh, academics. And I didn't really understand that until I got into academia and kind of started, um, kind of grabbing towards myself and create my own narrative, um, and so it's important and uh, to acknowledge the, I guess, for lack of better terms, the fight that Cuddy people have had to, had to um, endure and start, you know, from the, from the beginning, um, whether it's federal recognition in the uh, 70s, 80s, um, 
to just fighting for basic necessities of life. And that was for us. We just, we just want our salmon to come home. You know, we want our salmon to be healthy. And that means our people to be healthy. And um, the fact that it takes decades, you know, pioneering in a hundred, you know, a century worth of work that needs to be done in order for those, those basic human rights to be met. Um, it goes to show, of, you know, how, how much a fight it is and how relevant a fight it is for us cutting people and other tribes and people with on the Klamath River and, and the Klamath Basin. Um, and so this work that Kari has been doing is, is taking strides, you know, taking large uh, revolutionary steps and, uh, the way she does it is also um, has had a larger impact. Um, you know, some, you know, historically you've had white settlers come into our ancestral territory and kind of just take notes about us and then, you know, claim it theirs and take off with it. Um, but I feel like this work that Kari has done is a lot of collaborative, you know, um, a lot of having a, a building of relationships and, that's who we are as people is building relationships, whether it's with non-natives, our own people, or, you know, the, the natural environment alone. And um, this is really encompassing and it really shows significance of where we want to be as kind of people. Really appreciate, you know, those words and thinking about, again, it's like not knowing the background of everybody. And I know that all of you are on this call by a lot of diverse background, but I would say that that is um, what Ryan just said about relationships is, um, one of the things that as a non-native person, I think I've so learned from working, um, you know, working with all of you and your family in particular, but, uh, you know, working with everyone in the um, kind of community is, is, you know, how things work, face-to-face -face relationships and the, um, the benefit of being able to learn uh, through them and share things and the generosity um, that I've seen in my direction and watched you know, towards others uh, through those relationships are, I think, incredibly important. Um, uh, for all of us to understand as we live in this advanced capitalist society where we are taught, uh, you know, that everything is just about money. I want to um, say that, you know, th this is exciting to be doing this book in this, in, this, in this forum, and I'm really honored and flattered. And I'm definitely honored and flattered that this book is useful for people in the community on the Klamath. Um, but I guess I wouldn't have had the audacity <laughs> to write a book sort of uh, about the community for the community per se. Um, and it is an academic book. Um, I think, you know, there's a lot of people's words in it and, um, uh, you know, a lot of quotes, a lot of narrative that make it much more um, accessible probably than some academic books. But I actually wrote this book um, because of all the things I've been learning with the Reed family and other um, folks there, everyone in the kind of DNR, Department of Natural Resources. Um, I was, started at some point, you know, after having done a lot of these reports, going back to my own discipline of sociology and realizing that things were just really unacceptable. And so actually uh, we are right now, this group of people who see pictured or as part of a core group of folks um, who are just been granted permission or not, uh, so that's not the word I, I wanna use. We've just been given the go ahead to start forming a, a section um, within the American Sociological Association on indigenous peoples. The, the, that organization has also done, um, beginning to do other decolonizing things. So this book was written um, really uh, to take my colleagues to task and hopefully improve the thinking within sociology vis-a-vis -vis indigenous peoples and traditional knowledge and all of these kinds of things. Um, and I just I want to speak briefly about the book and generally and, and the background of that. And um, it is an academic book and uh, a phenomenal one alone. And, um, you know, cutting people are a world of new people. And so that means that a lot of our ceremonies, a lot, a lot about of what that means is we're trying to fix the world, you know, and that's important when, when you, when speaking about cutting people is that we're not only trying to save ourselves um, or the, you know, the people in our basin, but it's collective, you know, everywhere. And um, it's important when, you know, sharing my narrative and who I am and the, the knowledge that I have uh, thankfully been given um, also that I've lost, um, but that's another can of worms is that um, we're praying for you, you know, people who I don't even know. And, um, and that's a part of the, the ceremonies itself. And, um, and with a land-based religion, uh, we can't have we can't have 
our culture anywhere else in this world. And, you know, it's connected directly to the land, our people, um, our ceremonies, our practices are uh, connected directly to, the, to this land. And um, that's a spiritual connection, you know, and um, what Kari has been able to do with this book is that she's able to tie environmental um, injustices with sociology, you know, and that's something that's often um, unheard of, you know, it's, 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 uh, uh, she's tapping into a collective in a disciplinary, uh, collective work that, um, you know, is, is really relevant within our culture. And she's able to bridge that gap between academic and academia. Um, and also just, um, uh, our, us as native people in academia and, and that those are large steps when thinking about us as kind of people is that, um, we don't just think about the environment. We just don't think about social aspects alone. We don't think just about um, physical aspects. You know, it, it's a collective. It's interdisciplinary. And when you go on tangents about, um, generally speaking, go on tangents about certain aspects of our culture, you know, that's just part of the story. You know, that it's everyday life that has different meanings, you know, whether it's going out and actually physically burning the landscape to help the environment um, you know, thrive, um, but also it's given that person who's putting the fire on the landscape uh, a sense of uh, well-being, you know, and you're out there physically doing that, and you're also um, benefiting spiritually and mentally, too, and so that's, um, and so Kari's work to be able to put that on paper and for people to really understand that is, um, again, large steps. Um, there's so many, there's so many ways to tell stories or to things to say about it. But one thing I for sure wanted to acknowledge, and it relates a lot to um, Brian's words right there, are just the all of the ways that the activity and the things that people are doing in the basin spread outward. And um, so, in terms of a lot larger advocacy and larger, um, larger ripple effect. And one of the ways is, um, you know, that Brian mentioned growing up, going to protests and um, and things down in Sacramento, going to rallies. Um, but also speaking. And so I just have a few slides of, of um, uh, Ron and I speaking in different contexts recently. This is Longhouse at University of Oregon. Um, uh, Ron and Robin there uh, spoke to my environmental justice class. I think this was just this past um, February or March, but I don't fully remember. I think this was actually just as the um, pandemic was really starting. Um, this is perhaps the year before, but University of Oregon, um, uh, Ryan's uh, brother Jason there, um, uh, 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 Cody Fish, and then uh, my sons, um, you can see Ryan and several of his brothers um, and folks, uh, my son's uh, kid, uh, grade school elementary class, and this is my uh, graduate class um, at University of Oregon. So, and then this was a panel that we did um, with uh, just Conrad there um, with a microphone panel that we did in Aotearoa in New Zealand on cultural burning, which was um, cultural burners from um, Australia and, uh, as well as um, folks from the US. And um, so there's just a lot of ways that um, that the work that's happening there, um, that's happening in the Klamath Basin is is people are doing so much that's sort of stretching, moving beyond it, telling stories in ways beyond it. I think, um, Katja mentioned the, you know, that the book has these sort of various uh, chapters and uh, standalone pieces in a way. And um, I thought I'd just quickly put the table of contents. I think I'll just, we'll just speak maybe more specifically about the, the stuff around food and health, which is in chapter three. Um, but for those that may be interested to see the bigger picture or the larger piece of it, um, within my discipline, within sociology, it was really kind of, came the idea that humans were no longer connected to nature because everyone was so modern and in cities and things like that. And so there's really wonderful theories about um, gender and race and there's a strong um, sort of, I would say social justice uh, component to my discipline, but there really isn't, a, that, that work isn't linked well with anything about how the natural world affects things. So the first chapter is looking at theories of race and, um, and how they, how, it, how what we think of as whiteness um, gets created and how white supremacy gets created in relationships with the natural world. Um, the second chapter is looking at settler colonialism and how fire suppression belongs, some, both of those first two chapters are a little bit historical, 
uh, concepts of fire suppression um, uh, as an example of a way of illustrating the importance of thinking about colonialism. And certainly it's been exciting to me in the last year, six months, three weeks. <laughs> it just feels like the thinking, the general public's understanding about colonialism and settler colonialism is really uh, growing. Um, the, we'll talk more about the third one, but that's the chapter that looks at relationships between health and uh, mental health and um, food and traditional foods and really came out of the work on the policy work on the dams. Um, there's a chapter that we won't talk about unless Ryan wants to bring it up or it ends up coming up that's really about gender uh, practices and sort of how different parts of people's identities as identifying as female or male are connected to um, practices in the landscape and what does it mean when you can't do those. And um, this, this chapter and then the next one were, well, all of these chapters really came out of Indigenous thinking and Ron Reed in particular is um, talking about how all of these things are connected as we were working on the FERC licensing. So at some point he was saying, you know, we have to, this is about masculinity, we have to talk about what does it mean for our, our young men. And then the last uh, substantive chapter, um, thinking about emotions and he's talking as well about the importance of, of everything that was happening um, with the river and other aspects of things in the land, um, how this is about mental health and um, people's sense of, of well-being. Right. So um, uh, say some words about um, this, you saw this image on the screen and the other one, but um, this is, um, as people may or may not know, um, if, if I could see well, I would ask <laughs> how many people know where this is or what's going on here, but I can't, I can't see those who are listening. So um, um, I'll interrupt first. Um, do you mind if I, we go back one slide? I kind of want to talk on chapter two slightly just to give more context of history. You know, uh, uh, you can hear, hear a couple of words about the, you know, historical um, past that us as country people had to endure and, um, but, you know, I kind of want to take a step in specifically that, um, that, that title of Ecological Dynamics of Settler Colonialism, Smokey Bear and Fire Suppression as Colonial Violence. And so as um, Kutch, Kutcha introduced us and a little bit about the work that's been going on in Cutter Country, um, a lot of it's fire. And I think that's one of the leading, um, uh, leading work as, as the Cutty tribe has been able to partner up with certain organizations around uh, around like our communities um, is fire, You're trying to reestablish the relationship with fire um, on the landscape and with our people. And um, and like, you know, uh, we've talked about this many times in our talks, Kari, but the violence that occurs um, in, in with fire suppression, you know, and um, I think I usually say this in almost every talk because I want people to really understand the violence, the historical violence that really occurred on beneath my feet right now, right here. Um, in addition to, you know, it's important to um, acknowledge that there's no rant, uh, romanticized history when it comes to genocide. Um, <clears throat> and, um, you know, the the Cuddy people had a, a bounty, you know, the state set, a, set aside bounty money um, to for uh, Cuddy people's scalps for if they were caught setting fires. And um, so that means that, you know, every person that's got people, you know, fires a part of our religion and we're part of, it's part of our identity. And um, when you're targeted, so that means you just automatically have a target on your, on your back when you're trying to set fire, you know, that's a, that's a like, religious practice. And um, that happened right here in Orleans. And, and a lot of the um, racism that was institutionalized from the Forest Service or from, you know, the federal government, um, the people who are supposed to be protecting us you know, that was embedded within law, that was embedded with institution, and that was directly tied with fire suppression. And um, the fact that I can go outside right now and see, you know, see the smoke that's really up in our face, you know, that's that's um, direct colonial violence. That's the lack of fire that's been put on landscape uh, within the, you know, the past hundred years. Um, you know, that's, you know, it, it's kind of hard to not see that we're still in the state of turmoil, state of, the state of war. Um, when you got elders or people with um, uh, with health issues who can't really um, persevere through the smoke and these bad uh, air qualities, is um, that's colonial violence. And um, the fact that people don't really understand, you know, don't really see that um, when you first see smoke, you know, like oh, there's a fire. But you know, for me, just 
I grew up with smoke summer to summer, you know, some thicker, some closer, some further away, but you know, that's direct violence. You know, that that's my ancestors um, being targeted, being murdered because um, they weren't able, because they were practicing their religion. And now that um, these fires are occurring because, you know, in order for us to survive, we had to stop doing that. And, um, you know, there's a lot of different complexities and that are really relevant with, from the history to now. And so um, before, you know, I wanted to just kind of uh, make that apparent when diving into um, the different topics, especially the, the one that's coming up is food relationships and the leaks of environmental and human health is, you know, a lot of what, what this chapter is about is just, you know, basic health, you know, you know, nothing more, nothing less. We're not asking for uh, a whole lot more than just basic necessities of, you know, religious freedom. And, um, and, and again, like we're, we're a world of no people. And so uh, when speaking about that, it, it's collective of different um, departments, uh, you know, in a more modern context. Um, and so it affects us um, on such a collateral level. Thank you for those words, because it's, you know, the fire, the situation with fire is incredibly important. And, you know, there's not a lot that I would have, we would have necessarily touched on there, but it's certainly interwoven as well with, um, uh, with climate change and with um, fish in the river. And there's a wonderful website that we've put together related to the uh, kind of climate, climate adaptation plan. It's called Karuk Climate Change Projects. And on that website, there are actually three different videos. Uh, one is like a two minute video, a six minute video, and then there's a 30 minute video about what the tribe is doing in relation to fire in light of climate change. And there's also a little bit of the history that Ryan mentioned is touched on in some of those. So um, thank you for those words. It's also an example, you know, there's, I feel like as a scientist, as a human, my life has in, just been incredibly powerfully impacted. I've learned so much, I learned so much every time I'm on the river interacting with your family, Ryan, and um, it's, it's just remarkable. So it's, it's been quite a pleasure. And um, this image is of the um, behind Iron Gate Reservoir, the um, cyanobacteria, the blue-green blue algae, which is highly toxic. And um, so those dams are, and I don't know what it looks like right now. I don't know, Ryan, if you've seen recently or just what the river is. You start seeing algae in the river as well. Um, but um, the, the dams on the Klamath River, um, I guess we don't have an overview slide, but the dams on the Klamath River are slated to come out um, in two more years, we hope. Um, I know there's been just a recent ruling by FERC that's, um, that does move, keep that process moving forward. And, um, but as I mentioned before, you know, this first project that Ron and I did is really about the blending of indigenous science and Western science. And in that, obviously there was a lot of Western science that's being used to document um, what's happening, the, the kind of water quality program, the Department of Natural Resources are using a lot of Western science, uh, documenting what's happening in the river, uh, temperatures, uh, all of the you know, sediment levels, um, algal levels. We had um, tissue samples um, from fish, which was um, one of the things that the California um, Fish and Game was thinking. But um, because of the work that Ron had been doing, um, Ron had been talking about his mother, whose voice you heard on the, um, the video, and she always talked about freshwater mussels and no one was talking about freshwater mussels. And so we started a project on freshwater mussels actually with folks here where I am speaking to you from in Walla Walla, um, the Confederated Tribes of Umatilla have been doing work on freshwater mussels. And um, so because there had been a project ongoing on freshwater mussels, when the, um, tissue samples were tested to see a Pacific Corps was claiming that that all of this stuff that you see in the lake had actually no downstream effects was actually not bothering people at all because there was no downstream effects of their dams. Well, because we tested the tissue of freshwater mussels, we were able to find um, down this the bioaccumulated these cyanobacteria, which is highly toxic. So this is just one little example of the ways that indigenous and Western science together has been, um, was very powerful in the work um, that we've done. I don't know if you wanna say anything about the algae. But. Um, yeah, um, as, as salmon people, algae has probably been one of the um, largest problems within our river system. And, you know, like I mentioned before, I'm the spring salmon ceremonial priest in, in Namwan. And so, um, 
and it's it's kind of relevant it is relevant um, because i'm actually fasting for that right now as we're speaking um, and i made the medicine less than a week ago or about a week ago um a little over a week ago sorry i forget what day i'm on um but and when you know during that time of making medicine and uh, being in seclusion being isolated from uh being more isolated than we usually are right now than you know from from my relations is you know one of my tasks for me as a on the physical aspect is that you know i have to bathe in the river um where, where i'm where my camp is and um this year you know every year to year uh, it's my third year doing it and it, you know the river quality is getting worse and worse and this year has been um, probably the, the most extreme that I've had to deal with. And, and, you know, from people who live on the Klamath River, you know, hearing me say I have to bathe in, in the Klamath River, you're alone, you're just, you're, you might cringe. And, and then this year, if you go down to where I had to bathe, you probably, you wouldn't even want to step foot in it. And, um, you know, there's, uh, invasive species such as, you know, bluegill, uh, sunfish, I think that's the same thing, but bass and, you know, large, um, large areas of just seaweed and moss and accumulation of all in together uh, of algae. And, you know, that's a direct effect, effect from the dams, you know, the lack of water in the system and, and the extreme temperatures that, you know, we endure year to year during the summertime when, you know, that's the, where the most vulnerable as, as the river is. And, um, you know, I, you know, as, on a personal basis, I'd bathe in that, you know, multiple times a day. And, and the fact that, um, I guarantee if I go up to the people in power who are, you know, fighting to keep this damn in that, you know, I tell them, you know, <laughs> what I just think to myself is, you know, I'm going to go grab a jar, jar of that water and tell them to bathe with, bathe with it, you know, and that's my, that's my religion right there. You know, if, if you're holy water and, or, you know, whatever religion that they they practice, if they have to, um, cleanse with that and their spiritual way, like, um, and they don't want to, like, you know, that, that's what I have to do. You know, that's just because that I don't have access to clean water, um, because of, of my lack of privilege and economically. And, you know, as far as my lifestyle that, um, you know, it, there's just no leveling, you know, there's no, um, understanding with the people in power who, who are fighting to keep this, uh, these dams in and these water qualities low. And, um, and, and, and again, you know, I'm a spring salmon ceremonial priest. And so, you know, what I'm also thinking about is the spring salmon. Um, and, you know, they're, they're one of our largest, historically, one of our largest um, uh, food sources. And, and, you know, now that, uh, you know, we can't even really fish for them, you know, and uh, we've, we've caught some in the past down the Ishikishu Falls and stuff like that. But, um, you know, that's like two or three out of the year and when one of our main food sources has been limited to two times or three times in the year what do you expect um when you see all these different men mental and physical health um disparities and problems occur you know it's only it's only basic common sense that these things are going to happen when your food sources um becomes ill you know or you know become full of bioaccumulation and, and all that stuff and and so when speaking about salmon and speaking about these different resources, uh, when our main staple, our, our spirit, our spirit of our culture is being treated or having to endure through these different water, or through these different water qualities and um, these different conditions, you know, it, it's uh, it's problematic from from the roots. So powerful to to speak with you, do this with you. Looks like we did get a, um, a picture of the dam. I think this one came from National Geographic and I'm not sure I gave a photo credit there. Um, so sorry about that. Um, but um, yeah, so the, again, that, you know, this work in this chapter of the book came out of the work that Ron and I have been doing and that Ryan's been involved with in um, many increasing dimensions through his life and through the time that this has been ongoing. Um, the, the book chapter, I was really reflecting a lot on um, the relationships between indigenous and Western science and the ways that, uh, yeah, that there's a lot of successes because our work actually did get quite a bit of traction, um, both in um, getting media attention, but also in the scientific process as well. And I think it's precisely because indigenous knowledge that was centering all those connections. Um, and Ron's saying, you know, this is, 
This is about our physical health. Uh, first of all, just seeing that the, the difference, I think that this is the slide I want here, um, that his community has gone from um, getting their food uh, from dipping out of the falls to commodity, people having not enough food or having commodity food coming out of cans and um, the, the multiple, multiple layers of that. And if you took this, say from a strictly Western science perspective, uh, you might be thinking about variables and how to control these variables and you know what's separate from what and can you separate the amount of diabetes that comes from um, not having fish versus the amount that comes from not having exercise or the fact that people um, drink alcohol or all of these different you know, thinking about things as sort of separate. Um, but in working with Ron, it was so clear that it made sense for us to be showing that these are all connected. So that if you are, so the, the crux of the work, um, stepping back for a second, is the, the report that was filed, Effects of Altered Diet on the Health of Kodak People, showed um, that Kodak people had very high rates of diabetes and that basically the time period through which families were developing diabetes and heart disease and um, as, as well um, was corresponded with the drop in people's salmon consumption. And I didn't put in a ton of slides um, from the data, but the, the report is available online and um, as our sort of shorter versions and chapters, but also uh, the um, it talks about it in the, in the book if you're interested. And um, so this way of instead of trying to uh, you know, separate like, oh, you can't prove that or you can't show, you know, that there's this relationship there. It's like, well, people live this relationship. It's really obvious that the dams that have no fish ladders um, were causing the loss of salmon and that the, um, that the loss of salmon had so many multiple layered effects in the community. And so again, that, that, um, that framing in that report made it to the front page of the Washington Post because no tribe had had claimed that in FERC before that, that or no one had claimed um, you know, that a dam was giving them artificially high rates of diabetes. So again, the basic framing was all coming out of indigenous science and lived experience. But then what we did is we looked at health data, we looked at um, uh, um, historical records, this material. So essentially the, the bigger picture on that is that people have been eating um, uh, large amounts of salmon you know, seven or eight runs of salmon of the Klamath River, people, you know, stored it in different ways, um, but that that has basically more recently um, disappeared and gone to much smaller um, uh, amounts. Did you want to say, I feel like I just kind of went on a roll there. <laughs> no, you, that's, I mean, you're, you're killing it. <laughs> <laughs> So, um, so one of we'll, 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 you'll, 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 you'll get you'll be moved to speak in a minute, I'm sure. Um, one of the things that um, that um, uh, is really it, it striking to me in doing this work is that kind of people have had one of the most recent and dramatic diet shifts of people in the of indigenous people in the United States. So there's other you know folks like even the Yurox down on the mouth um, have you know more access to fish. Um, and folks up in Alaska as well, having more access to fish, but that, um, and then in other communities, you know, those traditional foods and the extent of colonialism was so extreme um, and, and the forced assimilation was so extreme. So that it happened quite, you know, a century ago, but that really it's in people's lifetimes, lived experience um, that people went, oops, sorry, I thought I had a different slide there, um, that people went from having, um, you know, salmon several times a day, as much as they could eat, to really having almost none at all. And yeah, I'll speak on that real quick and uh, just acknowledge our, our time check. I want to give, give time for uh, Q&A and stuff like that. Yeah, as well. This is a little portion short, but um, those stats that Kari put up on the slides and, you know, it's, you know, I've experienced that within my small time I've been on this earth, you know, um, and then that video at the beginning of our presentation and there. There, my dad was loading up on the, of a whole, uh, a large amount of salmon right there in one dip. And, um, you know, we talk about this every time, you know, from, you know, the, I was probably just born or, you know, one or two years old during that times. And I grew up, you know, my early times of childhood, like just watching those large amounts of fish coming out of those falls and up to probably the maximum of 150 fish a day. Um, coming out of the falls that would get distributed to the community or people who would come down and help and, you know, work for, work for food and stuff like that. And um, first of all, that relationship is, is immense in cultural longevity. Um, but now if you skip forward to the last five, six years of my, of my life, you know, 
there's been years of single digits in a year. You know, I remember one year we, my dad caught maybe five or six in the whole year, you know, and it, it, it's crazy that that uh, dramatic drop in population that our, our people are consuming of salmon. It, 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 it's um, unsustainable as human beings and, and just environmentally um, degrading, you know? And so, it, I mean, it, that's kind of a, a reflection and reality of the life that us as cutting people are having to deal with. I think um, this is the, uh, almost the last slide. Um, in the, so there are other chapters, you know, look at um, how all of this, um, so again, there's a chapter on fire. Ryan touched a little bit on that. There's so much there, um, but also looking at a gender, looking at emotional impacts and how physical and emotional are connected. And all of this is so much uh, from uh, Ron Reed's thinking and understanding. And then, um, you know, I've worked with it in an academic sense and I try to put it in conversation with, a, with the other conversations that I know are happening in the policy world and in the academic world. But closing really um, the conclusion of the book and um, closing our talk now, thinking about one of the things that's most powerful to me um, is, is as Kutcha mentioned as well, the resilience of Kutub people um, and uh, the resourcefulness. And um, I don't know if hopefulness is exactly the word, um, but the sense that, um, that, that you don't get to give up and, um, and my other work on climate change is about very different communities and more about in the broader public, you see people becoming upset, but not really engaging and sort of jumping in. And um, this is a quote I have up uh, that uh, Ron, I don't remember exactly where we were when he said this, um, wrote it down and I was like, wow. Um, because this idea of seeing climate change as a strategic opportunity. So he says, we're trying to get back to an intact world Climate change can be a vehicle for that because of the awareness it brings to so many about limitations in the current management practice. We believe there's genuine interest in kind of perspectives about how to care for the land. And we offer these explanations in the hope that this is true. This was used in the front of um, our climate adaptation plan and possibly also in the knowledge sovereignty reports that were also around climate change. And to me, this, these words um, sum up so much of what I think as a Western scientist is incredibly important um, as a non-native person to understand about um, indigenous, um, uh, indigenous perspectives, indigenous values, um, uh, knowledge systems, all of these kinds of things um, that there really is, my ancestors came from Scandinavia and what they came to a place that had a lot of stuff that was doing pretty well and it sure doesn't look like that now. And yet so much indigenous knowledge is still present, not only in terms of fire practice and all these uh, specific techniques and these kinds of things or the ceremonies, but um, also in terms of ways of being in the world. And um, I know that I learn so much from um, you and your family, Ryan, all the time and um, everyone at Kudok DNR and other folks there. So it's um, the work that we've spoken about has changed my life in the most profoundly wonderful ways. Yeah. And, um... I, what I kind of want to last one of the few things I want to last say is um, uh, what my dad, you know, just said in this quote that climate change could be a vehicle. Um, you know, that's apparent. You know, that's you know, I can speak all day about the atrocities, the violent history, and the, and the lifestyle that we have to endure on on a negative note, but on a positive note. You know, there's a lot of work being done, and there's a lot of people who are in the positions that you know, it creates hope for our next generations. And, and for me as an individual, as a, as a young, um, young man in this world, growing up on this landscape, you know, there's, there's a lot of hope for the future generations. And I'm already thinking about future generations at age 20. And I think that's a, that's a concept that often gets unheard and unheard is, you know, why our culture is all is about as cutting people. And I mean, really native people entirely is keeping that, that culture continuing. And, um, the work that's being done as far, you know, putting fire in a landscape, you know, uh, all these WKRP and all these different partnerships, what they're doing is creating a, a future, you know, they're continuing our future as people to live off this land. And, um, and you know, it's phenomenal to see, and, you know, amongst all the devastations that I keep um, seeing as I grow up, um, there's, you know, there's, you know, the other side of positivity is starting, is starting to, you um, starting to increase and starting to catch up. And so it's, it, it's uh, um, promising to see all this work and all these phenomenal people, these opportunities come through. And 
um, again, like this work is interdisciplinary. And so if you, if you're thinking that you have no ability to, um, not, you know, not speaking specifically just cutting people, but, you know, as native people generally is, um, you, you have the ability as academic in these different positions to create change in these native communities or in any community, uh, uh for what you will. Um, and so, you know, it, a lot of it is just about building relationships and, um, being a community to, help the environment and you know in time in an era of climate change you know it's only relevant that um certain people step up and and that's what it's going to take is people to step up and work together so yotva and is that it are we, are we done with ours? I think so. I'm, cool. Kutch, I don't, you, you want to field questions or? Thank you, Yotva. I will go ahead and I, we have a, just, we have a few questions and I want to encourage people who are on the call. If you have questions, you can either type them into the chat or you can type them into the Q&A, which uh, you'll find at the bottom of the screen on Zoom. So I'm monitoring the Q&A and also the chat. I. Thank you so much for sharing and for those amazing stories and photos and uh, really for being so open with people about your experiences. Um, the first uh, question we have uh, is really, I think this is for you, Kari. Uh, is there any way to share a link to the 2014 paper on forested lands and climate change? Do you know if it's open or behind a paywall? Uh, the, the report, uh, the report that I had up on knowledge sovereignty, I'm guessing, is um, that is on Karuk Climate Change Project's website. Um, if you just Google Karuk Climate Change Projects, um, sorry, I don't have the actual, it's like a little bit longer URL with the WordPress, but it, that has a whole tab with a lot of excerpts as well um, to uh, of the chapters and images, there's videos related to the material. So yes, it's, there's no paywall. It's definitely very available. Awesome, thank you. And the next question is also for Kari. Uh, given the history of violence and white supremacy in STEM, where, whereby Western science has been weaponized against black, indigenous and people of color communities, what was your own growth trajectory within <laughs> that led you to decolonize and dismantle these negative forces while still participating in the system of knowledge. The second part of that question is how have these conversations played out with other colleagues in your field? And what might you say to other scientists who have not started this growth and exploration in their own work yet? There's, there's some background noise I'm gonna put on the earphones. That is a phenomenal question. Whoever sent that in, uh, thank you for that. Um, my growth trajectory. <laughs> is a continual um as i said i think i i learned something every every day every minute i've learned so much from each of you on this call um and uh thank you for that um you know i grew up in berkeley california in you know i talk about this a little bit in the first chapter of the book too um uh what has got to be one of the most progressive public schools in the country and um I, I do not know anything about what was happening on the river. I did not have any sense of uh, the kind of struggles that people have or the uh, richness of knowledge that's there, the ceremonies, all of the things that are happening. I didn't know anything about any of that. Um, and um, I, um, you know, it's, I became very politicized myself around gender. I became very interested in, so for initially and then other things raised as, I remember when I first heard about the concept of environmental justice, but it wasn't through my own direct bodily um, experience. Um, I learned about it in a classroom. And um, I, yeah, so there's, a, I mean, there's many, many pieces on the trajectory for me. I would say um, absolutely the, um, the work itself and the relationships. And I would say the generosity um, and friendship of the Reed family has been one of the most important things. I mean, certainly there were a number of times that your dad sort of took me back outside and was like, you cannot say that, do not do that. And I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> you know? um, but you know, that um, kind of um, information and education and patience and tolerance combined with a great deal of generosity and warmth. And um, you know, it's been, 
uh, I just, it, it didn't seem like there were, I mean, it's just how my life changed um, in that sense. And um, for anyone who's um, in my situation as a non-native uh, white scientist, I think there's a lot of resources for you now. I'm in the social sciences. Um, there are wonderful books about indigenous research methodologies. I mean, I would definitely encourage you to read Dr. Risi Baldi's um, uh, book, her chapter, she's a chapter there on anthropologists that is just excellent in terms of uh, turning the gaze back. Um, uh, we are dancing for you. But um, I think it's really important to, to, you know, I would say if, if you are in my situation, you, um, you've got some work to do. Uh, it may be helpful to remember that you, you, were, you didn't come up with this on your own, you were born into it and you've been systematically, um, uh, uh, information has been systematically withheld from you. Um, and that's how you've been made to play a piece in the system. And so I think, you know, on the one hand, you have to have some sort of gentleness with yourself because it can be pretty horrifying. Um, but on the other hand, there's, there's, there's a responsibility, no doubt, and work to do. And there's a lot of resources for that within different disciplines. Um, I think almost all the disciplines have people who are starting to think about this. You know, in some ways the sciences um, have less so in terms of the ways that this science of ecology has been complicit um, in, um, you know, in colonialism, is, is today complicit in colonialism. Um, other disciplines like anthropology have had kind of revolutions where they begin to recognize and people have really begun to recognize the way that, that their work has been weaponized. Uh, my discipline of sociology, I am part of a group of people trying to uh, keep, make that revolution happen a little bit faster because we're a good 50 years behind anthropology there. And um, anyone wants to talk to me about that, feel free to email me or uh, send me something in the chat offline. But, but yeah, it's a great question. I do appreciate because one time Ron, um, Ryan Reed's father, right? And he's really featured in the book, came to speak to one of my classes of like budding scientists who are interested in this. And they were asking him lots of questions about working with native people. And they're like, but you know, what about this? And then he finally said, if you wanna work with us, you gotta have thick skin because we <laughs> will tell you what we think. And I was like, that is a really good, training for students because I because they get all these sort of helpful hints but he was like they gotta have thick skin if you want to work with native people and mm -hmm. I was like yeah so I appreciate that um when you can take the criticism and kind of grow from it I think that that's really important because native people have had to deal with a lot of people trying to tell them what to do and how they're supposed to be and I think now we're starting to say like no we have to maintain like our sovereignty and our self-determination and um and we're not going to do that we're not going to let that go, right? Like we're going to really stick with that. So, um, and Ryan, for you, um, how has it been working as a student um, on these projects now? And do you see them differently than when you were younger, sort of working on them? Like, is there any insight that you've gotten doing things like as a student or a researcher from uh, ad that adds to your understanding of some of these issues? Yeah, um, I mean, honestly, a lot of that has to do with credibility, you know, your voice becomes a little bit more weighted than, um, than the next, uh, but also it gives you confidence that me as just a young academic student has um, just as much insight or knowledge than someone with a PhD student, you know, or a PhD in general. Um, and not saying <laughs> Kari has beyond more knowledge of uh, in, in many uh, different aspects, but it just gives me, um, again, confidence that, especially within um, kind of going or trying to get through different obstacles within academic as a, as a native student, um, that I, I can, you know, I can handle my own with these such a different PhD professors who think they know it all. and. Um, that gives me a lot of uh, hope that my perspective is um, has a large structure as a cutic person, or you know, as a people come from um, from this area, um, and it, it just really gives again, it gives uh, credibility to my perspective, and and it continues to ensure me that the road I'm on is 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 powerful, and it's not just my own road, but it's it's my my people's road, and our 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 world view is. Um, you know, if you grasp onto it, you know, there's a lot to do with it, even in this modern world. And the next, the next question I like a lot, uh, it was, what about the acorns and how does acorns fit into this conversation? 
Um, yeah, I mean, acorns coincide with fish through and through. And um, uh, if you know a little bit about trees or the acorns or, you know, gathering it, uh, a lot of it has to do with um, how healthy our forests are. And if you go through our forest right now, um, in our different um, historically gathering areas that our forests are really healthy, you know, a lot of, there's a lot of brush and um, fire suppression that's really budding on up on um, uh, on our acorn trees that, you know, take uh, 50 plus years to really produce a amount to feed our villages or our people. Um, and when fire is lacking there, uh, it, you know, a lot of that nutrients and that water is soaked up by this, under, this understory brush. And, you know, that also, you know, that takes a lot of uh, away from the acorn trees, but also takes a lot from our fish. You know, there's these different um, unnecessary brush that's being kept there uh, when it could be used for our salmon or for our acorns. And so um, fire, water, you know, all those different aspects, you know, are, are, uh, are relevant to each other. And so, and a lot of the, a lot of this stuff that we're talking about today has to do with identity. You know, if a uh, traditional diet and the things that we're talking about has a lot to do with who we are and what we're about and acorns is just that. And then uh, this is a general question. Uh, are there any comments from e from either of you on the preferred use of terms like traditional environmental knowledge, traditional ecological knowledge, or traditional science? Are these things interchangeable? Are there preferences? You'd be a good one to speak to that. <laughs> um, I should probably really dive into that. That's a good question. I need to really differ if there is a difference between each other. Um, but for me, you know, traditional knowledge and traditional ecological knowledge is, you know, they're, they're different. Um, you know, you're speaking in, in a specific uh, discipline when, when talking about that. But again, you know, it's all interdisciplinary, all is woven in together. And um, when you're speaking, I guess that has a lot to do with what you're speaking about is, um, uh, but, you know, that's a really good question that, you know, again, I'm a student, I'm always learning and uh, that, that's something I got to take on to the next. So thanks for that question. And I was thinking that sometimes people use, I've been using increasingly the term indigenous science as well. Um, and it's, yeah, and I was thinking, Kasha, you might have some words that you would want to share there. I mean, I think one thing that's, um, I feel like I see on the academic side is that there's, um, there's a way that at least in the in the ecology fields or in you know forestry fishery, fisheries there uh, fire science you know there is a recognition of a lot of indigenous science uh, to get tr traditional ecological knowledge has become this kind of it's, it's become a very exciting thing to work on and that's good but it's still kind of set aside is this other type of thing and um, so you know using that term indigenous science is a way of of really acknowledging I think that um, there are, you know, in, in addition to the ways that I was raised, this whole continent was shaped and flourished because of very sophisticated ways of knowing the world and, and interacting with the world that were, um, you know, say rigorous, I don't know what the words are, but there is a whole way of seeing and doing things that, that is its own science. And um, I think that many of the people on the academic side are, are not getting that when they just hear the term traditional ecological knowledge. No, I think that that's an excellent point. And it's one thing that I often teach to people is like, we have to be able to critique the terminology of traditional ecological knowledge and what, how it sort of separates us from a conversation sometimes about science, because it's like, it's not quite science to them. But I will say that um, I also, you know, I get feedback from people saying, well, we also don't want to just have to say we're just like you, right? Like we also have biology and we also have this because we do have things that are even outside of that, like spiritual interactions with the environment that can't be kind of quantified or, you know, experimental tested. And then we know that they are true. People sometimes get information from dreams, right? They sometimes get information from like beyond worlds and so how do we talk about that if we're just if we're just saying and is that science and do we want that squished in the same place so i think it actually needs to have a really complex conversation but i will say that um i think what i always say to people is like indigenous science is very old we have a lot of 
knowledge about this place because we're, you know, minimum 10,000 years, right? So that's a lot of scientific experimentation. That's a lot of observation. That's a lot of like, now nah, that didn't work. Let's try something new. So we're coming at it like from that knowledge and there's a lot to learn from there. And my uncle, when I would ask him like, why do you guys work with like these scientists? Cause you know, they, they're always like asking weird questions or they are like intervene, like they're interfering when we're talking. And he said, catch a um, Western science is like, they're like toddlers. Mm -hmm. he, and they're they're just starting and he was like and you know they always come to you and they're like I know I know like you start talking to them and they go I know I know he's like like toddlers and we I'm trying to help them like grow up a little bit because we're the adults here we're the ones with all the knowledge so we got to like push them in that direction so I kind of I love saying that to people like that he was from the beginning like western science is like toddlers and that's why we're helping them so that they can live here and like not mess it up and I was like, okay, so I do think that, I mean, that's kind of how I approach it too. Um, so we have time for maybe one more question and it actually leads pretty well into the discussion. I mean, the thing that I need to sort of uh, end with. Um, so it says for you all, now that the Klamath Dam removal has been thrown into question by Pacificor and the FERC decision to keep, the Pacific, to keep Pacificor on the dam license, what needs to happen to make sure that Pacific Corps removes the dams? That's a great question too. Uh, I don't know. That's not a, I'm not, I mean, I think I'm, um, it's a good question. It's a question that everyone in the basin should be thinking about. I'll say that first of all, I think it's a very good question. Um, and I would hardly presume to be like, have a definitive answer on that. Um, I think that, um, you know, I haven't been intimately involved in policy stuff on this. I mean, my, my, my entry point in the issue has been, um, I would say, you know, to contributing, trying to make things visible in the scientific process and through trying to put my body in the street in different ways or create, create films that, that help make the story uh, visible. Um, so that said, um, you know, so it's not that I have a, have a <laughs> an answer to that question, but I think that is a question all of us should be asking. And I think that if we look at, um, you know, there, there's multiple layers, you know, there's the bigger picture of the election and everything that's happening in the country now. And I think that obviously that's going to be a big thing of what direction things go there. Um, so I would say um, anytime uh, something really big is happening, sh making it very clear that there's political mobilization at, you know, the so-called grass grassroots is really important. And so communities staying strong, staying vocal around the importance of this issue, um, around, you know, what will happen if, um, you know, ramifications for Pacific Corps or what, whatever those kinds of things are. I'm not somebody to develop that kind of political strategy, but I do think it is, that is the question uh, that I hope um, everyone listening is going to be putting their mind to and especially everyone in the basin and yeah, I don't, I'll go, go. yeah sorry uh, i don't have a policy answer just like kari but you know um this the work of uh undamming the klamath has been you know from the beginning for many of decades and so um i think that if we still continue that that drive and that momentum that we've gathered over many people from many people from different places and you know, over this course of time that uh, it's important to you know finish finish the job and you know I'm I'm a sport I'm a sports guy and so um, it's not the game's not quite over you know there's the fourth mm -hmm. quarter left and you know even though we might have look like we have the game in the bag and, you know it's not you know we gotta finish it until the dams are coming out and our people are gonna get better from it and so I um, mean really I think on a more generally aspect it's about keeping that keeping that aspirations and uh, the momentum that people who even are not here with us anymore um, to really um, continue that, continue that talk and continue that momentum. So I want to thank everybody for today. And I did want to share something from Save California Salmon, which is a call to action and alert. I know that when people are on this call, they're often asking, well, what can I do? And there is something going on right now that is very important, which leads us from this question about there, uh, the removal of the Klamath dams at this point feels like it is being called into question about whether it's actually going to happen. And I think a couple of months before this, people were really positive that no matter what, the dams were going to get removed. And there were things that have happened now at um, a government level that is sort of making it so that perhaps there's a way for them not to remove the dams. 
I would like to say that what I get from these types of presentations that I think are really important and the work that Kari does and the work that the Reed family has done and the work that these nonprofits have done is that we need to understand that dam removal is not an option anymore. It is a necessity. Mm -hmm. And if we don't do it, then something, then really bad things are about to happen to our ecosystem, to the peoples. And this is for all of us. And so I keep saying, how much evidence do we have to give people about the impacts of these dams before they will finally say, it's not an option, it's a requirement. And so Kari can do work to go, it's actually affecting people on the ground, it's affecting health, it's affecting the way people view their culture and the scientists can do things that are saying it's killing the salmon and people can do things to say it's actually affecting all of the ecosystem and still for some reason people are willing to say well maybe there's some way we can keep them and i think what we have to keep in mind is all this work has been done to show people it's not an option anymore it's a requirement or otherwise we are setting ourselves up for damages that we cannot come back from and i think that when we start talking about the potentiality of the um the end of salmon, it's very scary. Because as you see, for us, it is a spiritual practice, it's an emotional practice, but it also is a practice that tells us that we have futures and that those futures are important and that we can help and do things. And when we think about the impact of like the 2002 fish kill, that you are looking at a community that had to see thousands upon thousands of dead fish and watch as their elders cried over the state of like the salmon. And then that mobilized them into what they were supposed to do. But it also was a reminder that like, uh, this is what's going to continue to happen until these dams are taken down. So I want people to think about it as like, we can't talk about it like there's, a, there's some kind of fix to the dams. Like there's no fix to the dams. They need to come down. And so if you're interested in, under, in participating in this call to action, um, Save California Salmon has put out a call to action to tell Pacificorps to move forward with Klamath Dam removal. Um, so you can look at it on their website. On July 16, 2020, the uh, Federal Energy Regulatory Com Commission made a decision to partially transfer the Klamath River dams to, da to the dam removal entity for the purpose of dam removal and conditioned that Pacificorps remain as a co-licensee. Pacificorps now says that FERC's decision denies its customers the protections that it negotiated, and they plan to reconvene settlement parties mm. despite having collected $200 million from ratepayers for dam removal and $250 million for tax from taxpayers. So please tell Pacificorps that they need to participate in dam removal, that it is not an option. You can write, you can call Pacificorps directly. Here's the information for that. You can write to them on social media. I always tell people, start tagging them on Facebook and Twitter, post on their timelines. Um, like, just make it annoying. Be like, I'm still here talking to you about this. You can write a letter to the editor and submit to various publications. You can let people know that, that this issue is really important and that for the work that we've heard about today and the people we've heard from, it's not an option anymore and we have an obligation to this. So I encourage people to visit Save California Salmon, to see the action alert, to participate, and to make sure that people know about this work. Um, thank you everyone for joining us today. It was great. It was a great conversation. I really appreciate it. And I will say, if you are thinking about, I want to do more speakers, or I want to invite people, I would really encourage you to invite Ryan to speak and pay him lots of money to be able to come and talk with your groups and things. He uh -huh. is a student. I know students. They always need lots and lots of money. So pay him to come and talk and tell you more about the work that they're doing uh, in the community. Thank you. Thank you, Katja. <laughs> Thank you, Katja. Thanks to everyone out there for listening and the work that you do in the world.